You got to go. Those are amazing places. Amazing. Uh, uh, I'll be over there <laughs> in due time. Well, well, well. Okay. What's going on, creative people? This is Creativity is an Idea podcast, a source of creativity for creative people and also for anybody who wants inspiration and entertainment. So today's guest, oh, by the way, my name is Pyrick. If I don't mention my name, I guess it's not cool. I mean, they know who you are, bro. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> the name is Pyrick and I'm your host. So today's guest is a special person I've heard of since I came to Charlotte. And I think when I heard of him, I, did it, I wasn't even doing the podcast. I wasn't even thinking about creativity. Word. I was in um, branding and marketing and um, I had a cousin which I call my daughter and she met you one time and she was like blues 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 I'm like okay who is this blues and I'm like cool so I keep seeing him around and when I started getting into the creative scene um, some of my friends kept mentioning his name they keep seeing him around and hollering at him and stuff and then when I started this podcast his name started coming up Carlos mentioned your name. Yeah, that's a homie. Um, Naj Hood mentioned your name. That's the homie. <laughs> and a uh, few people also in here. Um, what's her name? Snap, 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 Snap mentioned your name too. Um, she's a rapper. She mentioned your name yeah. too. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So, All right. That's, that's, that's love. I like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> it's love. It's love. And people do love doers. And I really, really appreciate you being on this podcast and appreciate here it. to share your life and your knowledge and things people can also learn from. Thank you. Yeah. So you're in Charlotte. So let me ask you, first off, I was going to ask you who you are, but I wouldn't. <laughs> we, will, we will talk about who you are when you answer this question. So how did you get, if you don't know what he does, just listen. How did you get into what you're doing now and what is the name for it and how do you feel about it? Um, so what I do, I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, I, I'm a writer because I have, I've written for a lot of people and done a lot of things, but my start was in poetry. So mm -hmm. started off as a poet um, in high school. My uh, English teacher challenged us to take a Shakespeare play and rewrite it like mm -hmm. for modern times. So I took Romeo and Juliet and made it like a real hip hop version of it. And I was like, yeah, this is dope. This is going to get an A because uh -huh. this is fly. This is fresh. Man, she gave me a C. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you did I your was, best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, all right. All right, you tripping, but it's cool. But that taught me to love the art of words and what you could do with it. So from then on, man, I, I started writing. We used to have this little group, and I think it was like our civics class. Mm -hmm. And we write down battle rhymes. It was passing the note around. It was mm -hmm. like the nerdiest little cipher. But <laughs> we did that, man, and I was really falling in love with words. And then, you know, I graduated high school. And I was I was in a relationship. I was super in love. And then we did the long distance thing and that didn't work out like Sucks. I wanted it to. And it was it was bad. The breakup for me was bad. <laughs> and you know, black black boys aren't taught to like deal with their emotions. You mm. know, you just suck it up, move on. But I cried for like days. Mm. I was messed up. <laughs> and and poetry is what kind of brought me out. So mm. I started writing and it was very dark and depressive, but it was therapeutic for me. Mm. And so I started doing that at open mics and people were like, yeah, that's that's cool. But, you know, it's real sad, but it's cool. So um, I started doing that. And then I found out that, you know, sex poems makes the girls go crazy so i was doing mad sex poems. was that a revenge way of getting someone i don't know back? if it was a revenge way <laughs> but it was definitely like that gratification mm -hmm. from just something you know because i needed something and i was just you know filling a void and that was mm -hmm. it and get the oohs and ahs and that kind of made you feel better and then jessica care more came to uncc um it had to have been my sophomore year uh -huh. maybe and she did Black Statue of Liberty or Black Girl Juice and these amazing uplifting poems and people were like on their feet. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. That's how I want to make people feel. Yeah. So then like it was like the day after I wrote my first poem and it was about women and their struggle and how they uplift each other. And 
I did it at an open mic and the crowd was loving it. And I was like, yes, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. And so uh, from then on, man, uh, this guy named Terry Creech saw what I was doing. He was like, yo, I love it. He moved to Texas, came back, introduced us to slam. So then we got into slam poetry and then mm -hmm. we were just we were just poets doing that, doing our thing. And fast forward all these years, here we are. So, you know, it took some heartbreak. It took some you know, some, some sort of soul searching to figure out what it is that I wanted to do with my work. But from, from the essence, I'm a poet and I write and that's what I do. That's excellent. I know when you're able to see someone doing something and the person is getting results or the person is getting quote unquote praise from other people, they are loving what he or she is doing. It does something to you. It makes mm -hmm. you feel some way and like, damn, I want to be that. Yeah, want to do yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it help it it sort of changes your whole perception about life. It mm -hmm. changes your whole perception about what is possible and what you really want to do. And if you're able to capture that feeling into a bottle and take a sip every time yeah. you get a breakdown, that that is wonderful. It that keeps you going. It. That is it. it keeps exactly. you going. It, it it pushes you and it drives you and it keeps inspiring you. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing. You know, the more you're inspired, the more you create or the more you want to create, even when you don't feel like it. But something inspires you and pushes you. I think that's you know what a lot of creatives need. It's mm -hmm. just something inspiring around them, for sure. Yeah, they need to get a genie in the bottle. Who never comes up, but they keep looking yeah, at it. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that is excellent, Blues. Um, that is wonderful. So now let me ask you, who are you? I am, first and foremost, uh -huh. I'm a father. I'm a black man in America, and I'm a father of two daughters and a son. Um, and I grind. I uh, I love hip-hop. I love all music. Like, if you ever rode in the car with me, you you never know what you're gonna hear. <laughs> my music tastes be all over the place, but I'm a I'm a child of hip hop, so that's where my heart is. But I listen to all kind of music. But me, first and foremost, I'm a black man. I'm a father. I'm a husband, and you know everything else trickles down from there. Writer, poet, and all that other stuff. But that's me uh, in a nutshell. I'm I'm very quiet in a room. Like mm -hmm. I can walk in a room and just sit in a corner and be cool with that. Um, I, I've done that a lot. People be like, yo, how long you been here? Uh, I'll be like, I've been here like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be like, you didn't say nothing. I'm like, no, nah, I'm just chilling. Because sometimes I like to just walk in a room and just be in the vibe and just chill. I don't got to be the center of nobody's attention. I don't nobody got to know I'm there. I just, mm -hmm. just want to kick it. That's there's that's blues at the speaker. Oh, blues. There you are. Then yeah. everybody started looking at you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, that's happened a couple of times. I'm like, damn. <laughs> I should have I should have went further into the corner. <laughs> well, that's excellent. So that's who you are. So at this point, blues, how do you spell your name, by the way? I spell it B-L-U-Z. B-L-U-Z. Yeah. Blues. Tell you what, I didn't know that that's how it was spelled until I saw your Instagram name. <laughs> yeah, most people don't till they see that. And they be like, and then when they see it, they be like, Bluzz? Oh. Oh, that's happened so many times. I'd be like, Bluzz. And I walk up, they're like, oh, Blues. That's it. I was like, yeah, it's me. <laughs> blues. Yeah, wow. Yeah. That is excellent. So tell me, growing up, right, mm -hmm. how was your childhood? And I believe you said you, when you came to Charlotte, I think I was two years old. Um, <laughs> I was two years old. <laughs> yeah, uh, somewhere in Ghana, being chased by my mom somewhere, <laughs> or something, maybe disobeying or yeah. being quiet as a kid. Right. Um, how you've been in Charlotte for a while, and how was your childhood like? So I'm a child uh, of a milit of a I'm a you know, what they call an Air Force brat or an Air Force kid. Mm -hmm. So my dad was in the military. So we lived in several different places. Um, we lived in Las Vegas, Washington State, Germany, uh, came back and lived in South Carolina. So all over the place. And my childhood was, was pretty, like, I want to say random. Because, you know, when you're in the military, you get, you you're in a place for maybe two to five years depends really mm -hmm. depends so 
you make friends, but you be you're prepared to like, yo, we're going to be out in like a year. So you make friends fast and you guys make bonds quickly. So it was a lot of that. I have white friends, black friends, all kinds of racism people because of where, you know, because we moved all over the place mm -hmm. and I'm grateful because I got to see the world. Like I got to ski in, in Austria and I've got to see the castles in Germany and just been all over the place. But when we moved back to the States, um, it was really, it was really different because mm -hmm. um, we moved from Germany to South Carolina. So it's a bit of a little culture shock. Um, one, literally the atmosphere that we got off the plane and the heat and the mugginess. Just, <laughs> the summertime? Oh my, it was the worst, man. It was like, oh, what is this? And uh, we, got, we got clobbered with that. But then, you know, adjustments were made. I was finally back in the States. Because when you're in Germany, at back in, it was like the 80s, late 80s. Mm -hmm. We didn't get stuff when people in, a, in the U.S. got it. So if a cartoon or a movie came out, they got it like that day. We might not get it for like weeks or maybe a month later. Yeah. It took a while for it to catch up. And so I was doing a lot of catch up with stuff and figuring out what was what. But... Man, growing up as a kid, I was very different. Um, I didn't do typical black kid stuff. I liked rock and roll. I liked country. I skated. I skateboarded. I had a whole board and everything. Ran with a little crew. We, we did. They did. There we there was two different types of skating. You did street skate and you did ramp. And you know, I tried to do ramp, and it was not good. So I kind of got better at street, but I grew up and I got lanky. <laughs> so. I, I gave it up. And the, the thing that I attached myself to super hardcore was soccer. So mm. soccer was my thing. And that's the sport that I fell in love with. Um, I was I was very good at it. And mm. it, I took to it naturally. It was, just, it was just a piece about it. And I wanted to play football. Um, my mom was like, no. I was very small. When I was really? in my, oh, dude, don't let this size fool you. I was tiny. You, you are tall and... Yeah, I was tiny, and my mom was like, "No, you'll get broken in half." <laughs> and she was, she was probably kind of right, because um, those kids that were playing football were were, were kind of husky kids. They were bigger kids, and I was just small. I was just small, small framed. Um, but she let me play baseball, which was I thought worse because I'm playing baseball with kids who can't pitch, so I got hit with the ball all the time to a point where I had like a real like phobia fear when i went up to bat i would shake because i knew i was gonna get hit with the ball it's coming straight at you i got on base more times from being hit than actually hitting the ball <laughs> so baseball was short-lived i i enjoyed playing in the field that was fun um because uh, i was playing i uh, like left field and out there it's solitary it's quiet until mm -hmm. some action happens and i think that was the same f with soccer um I started in midfield and realized I didn't like to run as much as I thought I did. Mm -hmm. So coach moved me back into sweep because I was fast. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was fast and I was getting bigger. I was getting a little bit stronger. And I had, I had an eye for defense. I had an eye for offside traps. I just had an eye for stuff and I could handle the ball well. So it, and that was fun for me because in the South, you know, when you're a black boy on, pretty much half the time that you hit a field, you're probably the only black kid out there. You get called some stuff and people say some things and the ref's not going to hear it. So you got to handle it and being sweep stop, you get to, you know, do your thing. Yeah. You get to do your thing. I, and my coach is like, as long as you are playing the ball, it's in the and, game. Yeah. It's in the game. In the rule. <laughs> so I, I got my licks in, I got my licks in and that was fun. It was fun, but I also learned the game itself um, teaches you about how to move in life and about how to treat people and interact with people who don't look like you, but you guys have a common goal. And this, and the the funny thing was, the black kids would make fun of me for playing soccer. The white kids would be like, "You don't belong out here." But I was like, "This sport is played by more black people in the world than anything." And I was like, "People don't know that." I was like, ah, "Whatever, man." But I love the game, and that was like that was my childhood. I was. I was also in marching band, so mm -hmm. most people don't know that. Like, I played trumpet in the marching band. 
I had a marching band suit and everything. I was like a nerd in high school for real, for real. Wow. Like nerd <laughs> slash kind of. Being able to uh, yeah. participate in social stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, 19, like my junior year and maybe my senior year of high school, I was the water boy for the basketball team. Um, I wanted to play. I wanted to play basketball so bad. I sucked. I was terrible. I am terrible at basketball. <laughs> like, I can play a pickup game and be all right. Defensive, I'm, yo, I can shut my man down. It'll be four on four out there. But you get the ball in my hands and things get a little crazy. Like, <laughs> you're a little crazy. But the year, the first year I did it was um, when Ray Allen played, and he's now a Hall of Fame basketball player. Mm -hmm. They won state that year. So it was an amazing feeling to be just a part of that team, a mm -hmm. part of that process, and watch it from front to back, even though I was just, you know, the water boy. And that didn't bother me. I don't even know if people picked on me for that or they expected me to do that, but... They wish they were probably there. <laughs> yeah. I, in that year, they probably wished that they were there. So to go to to go from, you know, tryouts to all the way to the state finals and watch them win state was such an amazing ride. And... It's it, it all goes back to me just doing things different and unexpected. Um, and I've, I've loved it. I don't think I've regretted any part of my life uh, growing up in, in, in as a child. Like, it's cool. Both wow. parents were in the house. So that's big. Oh, wow. that's excellent. That is a, a trip you took us on. Yeah. Yeah. We just went on a trip. <laughs> yeah, You're we back did. now. We did. <laughs> Someone would say, excuse me. <laughs> <scoo." laughs> <laughs> so, Booth, um, I wanted to ask you, like, though you said when you saw this lady perform this thing on stage, it sort of dropped something on you. Yeah. And you wanted to do that for the rest of your life. Besides that, I believe there were situations in life that reinforced the mindset of you wanting to be a performing art artist. Yeah. So, how or when did you really decide to make up your mind okay bam this is it regardless i'm going forward for this when did you or how did you decide to really um it was the birth of my second daughter um 2006 yep 2006 um and my wife is in the hospital and my daughter's going to be here any day. Mm -hmm. And I get, I a, about a week before, I get a call from this guy, Kevin Jackson, who works for NASCAR. And he's telling me, hey, man, my name's Kevin. I work for NASCAR. Like, I really work for NASCAR. Da, 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 because I'd seen, you know, there's people who say they work for NASCAR or whatever. And I'm a big, I'm a big race car fan. I love NASCAR. That was something else. So mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he, he saw, like, this little interview thing i did in creative loafing is mm -hmm. like this little here's blues here's the things he like and it's like five little things it was small and one of the things was you know i like soccer nascar and you know just all kinds of music and he said i want to try something i want to see if we can blend with what you do with some nascar stuff and i was like cool you know mm. it's whatever i'm thinking it's just gonna be you know this little i write a little poem and you're they, done. they they do some other stuff. Um, he's like, no, okay. So here's what we're gonna do. We're my we got some people from this department who are gonna get your name, your date of birth, and we're gonna fly up to Indianapolis and we're gonna spend two days shooting. A bit. It was a. It turned into this big thing. And so the day after my daughter is born, I get on a plane and fly to Indianapolis. Mm. And now I'm in Indianapolis at the Indianapolis Speedway where they do you know, the Indianapolis 500, like the big races. And we're out there shooting and I'm doing this poem and I'm like, holy shit, this is great. And when they told me how much they were going to pay me to do it, I was like, oh, all right, <laughs> cool. And at the time, which was really the, the timing couldn't have been more perfect. I was working before we did the shoot, I was working for uh, Bay Heckle, which was which is the Fox News station here, as a camera guy. That's what, you know, I went to school and I learned how to work camera and do 
do uh, do PA stuff and just be a basic production assistant in a in a t- television station. Um, and I was working the morning shift, which was great because that way I could get off work, go home, take care of the kids, and send them off to school. Blah blah blah. And it was fun, creative, super creative in the morning. You gotta be because it's the morning. Something happened where they switched me to night side, and it was like, and I hate to say this, it was literally between night and day. It was just straight up news, <laughs> camera moves here, teleprompter, teleprompter. It was like that. And the news was always, you know, someone got shot. Here's the politics. <laughs> Here's the weather. Someone got shot. And it was Depression. boring. Yeah, it was boring as hell. There were no <laughs> guests. There was no funky cooking show. Because one show in the morning, there was a lion. Someone brought a, a, a little cub lion on the set. I'm like, this morning show shit is great. <laughs> I'm like, this is great. You're always and looking forward for something. Right. So it was at that moment my wife said, well, are you... You happy doing this? I was like, no, this isn't what I wanted to do. And I was like, I wanna I wanna do something. She was like, All right, well, you know, I'm doing well. Step back, step away from it. Because it was it was messing up the logistics in the house too. So mm-hmm. I she, you know, she gave me the space to quit and and she's like the reason I can do any of this. So she's like, Go ahead and quit, we'll figure it out. As soon as I quit you know, it was three months and we were struggling. Mm-hmm. We were struggling. And then the guy from NASCAR called. And then that's when I'm in Indianapolis and we're doing all this stuff. And then NASCAR's like, yo, that was really cool. Let's go ahead and do the whole season. So we did a whole year's worth of that stuff. And I'm getting paid for every single shoot. The same thing I got paid before. Way more money than I was making before. Wow. And that's when I said, I might be able to do this for real, for real, yeah. as a writer, as a poet. And then things just started falling into place. So with television, it's a network. Mm-hmm. So when people hear my name or see what I've done, oh, cool, can you come over to, and that's when I started working with Raycom Sports, doing stuff for the NCAA, for S- ACC and SEC, working with their basketball stuff, getting to do the Duke Carolina games. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. Can you come work with... Some people from the Hornets see me. Some people from the Panthers see what you're doing. So your name just starts moving around in different circles. And then next thing you know, you're like, yeah, this is what I do now. For real, for real. And you take care of the gift. And you realize that, you know, because Jessica Care Moore stood on stage and inspired you to do something different, now you can do that thing different on a whole other level. So it was 2006, the day after my daughter was born, that I got on that plane and... And when I got home, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. This is exactly what I'm going to do. It. There's no back and forward. Just like, a, was it a pit bull or a bulldog who has held on something? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Regardless, I'm not going to leave that jaw. Right. Open. I got just, it hooked. I'm going to hold on to it <laughs> forever. <laughs> so I chose to, okay, right. time to retire. Right, exactly. <laughs> so I'm tired, yeah, to the time to retire. Well, and you know, you said something, um, it was like three months um, before you got the call from the NASCAR. Mm-hmm. That three months, it was a struggle. Real I struggle. believe there was a point you wanted to, okay, should I? Yeah. Quit I was super questioning what I had just <laughs> done. Like, I know she said it was cool to quit, but man, this is not cool. Um, Should I quit? Though? Yeah, because, I mean, things were popping up. I mean, someone, I think I did security for like a little while. I actually was in a club as a bouncer. Okay. If that's a little known fact. And I, in my head, I was like, if something pops up, I ain't doing nothing. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to be calling the police. That's as close to bouncing as I'm going to do. Uh-huh. But I did some ins and outs, man, to make to make the money work, to make the money come in. But, yeah, I questioned it hard. Like, what am I supposed to do now? Like, hey, And I was like, I mean, the poetry thing is cool. I'd hit open mics, and that was fun. But it was only so much you can do Dude. with an open mic. If you know, if and unless you're like in New York or LA, you hit an open mic, but you never know who's in the crowd. They may see you, you get discovered, but blah, blah, blah. But we're talking about Charlotte, you know, mm-hmm. you don't expect anybody to be in the crowd at a poetry spot to do that. So, I, you know, it was 
because it's sort of the open mic stuff that I got the thing in creative loafing that someone else saw in creative loafing that got me the job at NASCAR. So break up the break. Yeah. And you, they're small breaks. You don't even know that they're happening. And the thing you have to do is be consistent with it mm-hmm. um, and be consistent with the craft. I know we were talking earlier, like you just keep grinding and getting better at what you do despite what's happening around you. And when someone recognizes your, your dopeness, then, it, then it'll pop off for you. So that's what, that's what happened. Yeah, that three months was real shaky. Like <laughs> I'm about to go just work for the city and call, and call <laughs> CG, it CG, I'm coming. Exactly. Wait for me. Exactly. Like, man, I'm about to go just get a regular-ass job. But, you know, and I did, too. I ended up um, going and working for CMS for, like, a couple years. But that was... That wasn't bad, mm-hmm. you know. It was it was a steady check. Um, it was consistent with what my household needed, and I was kind of able to still do the poetry stuff. Have some peace of mind too. Right, right. So there were some things that I was able to do, but yeah, man, that that little transition stage was, whew, could have been a whole lot different. Yeah, blues would be blues, but blues in another place. Yeah. <laughs> Be like you guys would, we would not be sitting here. I know that much. I'd be at home, sleep ready for my job in the morning, <laughs> which ain't a bad thing, yeah. man. I, I sometimes I envy people who have, uh, what I call a consistent and secure gig, because they know when that check coming in. You Once work today's date. Oh, yeah, three days more. Oh, right. thank He's... God. Huh? How much do I have in that account? Zero. Good. <laughs> right. <I'm> okay. Exactly. <laughs> When you working in this creative life, you'd be like, man, I hope I get something in a week or two weeks. And then you do, you might do a gig and it's under contract. So they get like a month to pay you. And, mm-hmm. you know, Duke Power ain't trying to hear that. Oh, that's a great poem. We still going to turn your lights off. Like it, it's, 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 a, it's a crazy thing. I'm looking at people, people who got that steady check. I'm be like, man, you lucky. <laughs> but I mean, I don't regret what I what I've been doing. It's it's a struggle, but once you start working out the business side of it, mm-hmm. you can kind of keep the money consistent. You just got to you got to work hard cuz you're working for yourself. You yeah. are the company, and if you don't work, your company fails. Yep. So, yep, yep, yep. I was listening to I read something on article about uh Frank Have Messi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was talking about he had to learn how to battle merge art he he being passionate about art painting and creating with business aspect and mm-hmm. when he was able to do that he saw progress because he he was from um Charlotte, uh, north carolina yeah if, if i'm right with the, where he was from so creative people if you had blues he said those three months was a struggle he was doubting himself and i believe some of you out there any creative entertainer out there there come a point Believe you me, we all we all doubt ourselves. We question our motives. We question our moves. Is this going to be the right move? Mm-hmm. Like we are looking for a sign, and the sign is probably not even showing. <laughs> so we keep feeling stagnant, and we don't know what to do. And everybody's life is going to be different, of course. Right. But just know that as long as you know what you want to do, or you have a desire to do something, and you keep at it, and you don't stop eventually things are going to happen like right, I, I, i've personally experienced certain moments like that yeah. like you question like gee i don't want to do this thing you you you're finding excuses all reasons to pull you out of it right and every reason you find is helping you to get out of it mm-hmm. but there is this instant or they call the uh, what is this i forgot the name you have to listen to your your instincts. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's telling you, okay, listen to it, listen to it. Then when you listen to it, it's able to like you 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 disobey all odds coming out to you and just move through. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So, if not, <laughs> nothing will happen. And I guess that's how it is. Right. All day. You gotta you gotta like you said, man, listen to your instincts, trust your gut. Yeah, trust your push, gut. And keep pushing, man. Just keep pushing. Cause ain't nobody gonna ain't nobody gonna live this dream for you but you yeah you know and that's that's the only way i I could ever see it like if i don't want it bad enough no one else is going to want it bad enough for me and then 
is a dead thing. I don't believe in dead things. So, yeah, especially when it comes to this art. And one thing I must say, uh, big ups to the lady behind you uh, for giving you some space. Listen, things don't work without without the white man. <laughs> I'm telling you, if it was just me by myself, this would be a whole different thing right now, man. She's she's everything. Yeah, uh, she is everything for sure. She knows it. She knows it. And I make sure she knows it. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Well, okay. So let me ask you, Blues. I believe everybody has a source of creativity on how they go about their stuff, how they sit down to write music. Oh, I had one guest here. He was like, oh, I sit down, I listen to the beats over and over and over again. And um, I also tried to write a song to a beat that I had and <laughs> had to go through YouTube over and over again. <laughs> 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 because I'm not a songwriter and I, was, I had to learn how right. to do it. So what is your source of creativity? How do you, what process do you go through? Where do you get your inspiration from to do what you do? For the ladies and the people, the audience listening to say, wow, okay. Um, well, for me, it, it really depends, though. Mm. Depends on what I'm working on. So if it's just creating for me, writing a poem for me, the inspiration could come from anywhere. Like, it, it, it's mostly about reflecting human experience. So it, for some poems, I've, I see stuff that happens on TV stuff in the news, you know, black men being shot, black women being snatched up. That stuff is easy. That sparks real easy. And then sometimes it's just it, an idea will pop in my head, usually when I'm in the car driving, hmm. and a poem is like, hey, I'm here, and you better write me right now. So I either have to write it, like some way scribble it down or pull over and write it. But it's the muse just happens any and everywhere, but it's generally from some sort of real human experience that someone is going through or that I heard about. And and it'll just hit me. Like I just feel it on a different level that it has to has to come out. Um and then there's stuff when I'm if I'm working doing the corporate stuff. So if I'm writing for the Panthers, like we just did uh, for the Bengals game. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted to do something that reflected the Queen City, uh, the difference between the two Queen Cities, because Cincinnati calls themselves the Queen City. Mm -hmm. And of course, we call that. ourselves the Queen City. So I wrote something to that, and uh, Jacinda Jacobs performed it. So Yeah, I saw, yeah. It, I saw it on your, um, in your page. Yeah, yeah, so those kind of things where I get... Or they give me the information, and I'm like, okay, cool, I can craft that. That's easy. Those things are really particularly easy to do um, because you have just what they want, and you can kind of give them that stuff back in a really creative manner. Because um, I've had to do, like, canteen stuff. Where the canteen group is the uh, largest group of, I guess, business owners. I don't know what you call them, but... Pretty much every vending machine that you see, uh -huh. Canteen probably yeah. owns it. The logo is on it. Yeah, I, I yeah. remember it reminded me of when I saw that logo at my workplace. I saw I'm like, oh, this reminded me of my schooling days. We were going to the canteen to eat. Right. We would rush there and you see food is available. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I had to do a poem for a bunch of white guys in suits about Canteen. And they loved it because they had never heard anything like that about their group. It's usually just someone stands up speaks and then they sit down so the creative process for every other thing can be very different sometimes but as far as a source it's always for me it's always a human source always a human experience be it happiness be it sadness some level of emotion mm -hmm. um or anger or funny like i used to really and i i still kind of do but you know the group collective, we used to run, you know, the whole poetry community. I I would write most f of the funny. If there was a funny poem, I'm probably the one who did it. Mm -hmm. um, and they weren't always funny. They were just, <laughs> sometimes they were just weird. But I didn't want to necessarily be the poet that was always doing the angry black man stuff. I just had weird shit in my brain. And I was like, I wonder what this would sound like. And 
Sometimes they'd be really funny. Like I did one about ugly babies back in the day, and it was it was ridiculous, but people laughed at ugly it. Ugly babies. Yeah, because so they, who are you to blame the parents? <laughs> I I don't. The, the whole idea was, you know, people are just nice when they see an ugly baby. Like, oh, that's such a blessing. Or ooh. His clothes is cute. You know what I'm saying? Like, you just do everything except talk about <laughs> no. the fact that this baby is ugly. <laughs> That's your yes, be yes. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah, man, the sources are always different. Um, and, uh, and they're usually from human experience or if my brain comes up with something super random and it feels weird, then I try it. Mm -hmm. um, if I know it's not normal, then I definitely try it. Because it's not normal is going to make me think and stretch my imagination. Normal, it'll get boring real fast when I'm oh, writing yeah. it. And you'll be like, this ain't what I'm supposed to be doing. Let's move to the next exciting thing. Exactly. Challenging. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to ask you <clears throat> the things that were holding you back, bef which you had let go. Mm. You know, and there is this uh, Newton's law, which I paraphrase, and it's, um, in order for you to move up, you have to let certain things down. Right. But before you answer... I see a saw here. It's <laughs> all. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you today. What's the name? I forgot my my script. <laughs> this a National Poetry Slam Championship uh sword and books. I don't know if it's ever had a name. Everybody just calls it winning the National Poetry Slam Championship. So, um that is the sword in the famed wooden books that uh you know, teams have started, uh, I think, that and the date might be on there, like 1990-something. This started years ago where they uh, were people 1996. from... 1996. It probably even goes further back than that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, the National Poetry Slam it was a, is a festival created for slam teams from around the world to come and compete for this, this coveted title where mm -hmm. your team is... Uh, puts poems up and they compete against other teams with their poems and uh, started the poetry slam started in Chicago by a guy named Mark Smith mm -hmm. and uh, it's been won by a lot of teams around the you know from 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 its inception till now uh, the cool thing about this is Charlotte is the only team that's won it three times oh baby yeah so out of all the teams you see on there you see some pretty tough teams there's some providence and i see you know, baltimore Denver, dallas yeah. new york san francisco san yeah. jose you've got some teams on there new orleans denver the only one that's that's done it three charlotte. times so we're proud of charlotte that again yeah and i'll see another charlotte again yeah. if you don't like it yeah. you can <laughs> up your game <laughs> <laughs> cleveland your game. okay Asheville, yeah. 95. I don't see Asheville again. Oh, sorry. So, Ash yeah, Asheville was like one of the first teams from the South to win it. Oh, 92, 1990, Chicago. Right, and, and the team from the South hadn't won it again until we did it in 2006. Wow. So, it had been a while, but, you know, we brought it back down this way. And we're super proud of it. Team is super dope. Uh, great collective of writers on the, on the squad. They did mm -hmm. their thing. And, you know, they brought it back home. They brought it back home. Yeah. Thank you all for bringing this back home. Yeah. yeah. Um, hope we keep it forever. You know, maybe. Yes. More than how long a president is allowed to run. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that was the National Poetry Slam Championship. Yeah. And Charlotte do have it, and they've won it for three consecutive not consecutive not but consecutive uh, yeah. three times three times yeah so this 2018 is ours and coming 2019 it's not leaving right <laughs> gonna hold on because to the whole team bit. is going to do their best which is going to happen anyway that was something i wanted to share with you all so if you are listening to this audio in an audio form i would encourage you to go on youtube search for creativity is an idea and type in Add blues, B L U Z to mm -hmm. it. I would say Z, but I like to say Z. Anyway, add it to it and it will come up, or you can type in C I A I blues and you're going to see what I'm showing in the video. 
Nice. It, it's pretty dope. When I saw it outside, I was like, okay, <laughs> I've seen this <laughs> online <laughs> on Instagram, but it's fun to see it in pre- in person. Right. You know? It's yeah. looking at me now, and now winking at me. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so now back to what I wanted to know from you. Um, before you have to let, you, before you have to go up. There are certain things you have to let down. So what was holding you back and what did you do about them to see progress? Um, I think for me it was a matter of discipline. Um, being where I say I'm going to be, doing what I'm saying I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm going to call myself a professional, I need to do more professional things. So I have a real and I still do have a problem with time. Um, I just, sometimes I don't plan well for time and sometimes I do. Sometimes I nail it. Sometimes I just (laughs) don't. Um, and when I, when I do that, I I feel better when I can get to a place and be there on time. Like, yeah, I feel like an adult because I did what I'm supposed to do. (laughs) So it's crazy. The moment you enter a place, you feel the cloud is in your mind. You're saying, yeah, thanks for making it. And I think uh, another thing I had to really do was let go of, I don't want to call it procrastination, but I, w- I will get in my own way um, mm. creatively. I'll be like, ah, that's not a good idea. Oh, maybe it is a good idea. Nah, it's not a good idea. I'll push it to the side. And it'll sit there for like two or three months before I come back to it. So it, I need to just jump on. Sometimes I have to just jump on an idea, pull the trigger, and let it go and let it just be Mm -hmm. um and not overthink it be overcritical and stuff like that um and i also had to learn to kind of for some people i realized there are some people that i just can't bring along with me they're they're just not at the level that i need them to be they can be great supporters great friends but as a in a creative space to help me do something or finish a project they're just not there all the time and that can be pretty disappointing because you you want to lift everyone you can you oh, really do snap and the first thing you sometimes think about you don't even think about yourself you'd be like oh i know he'd be great for this project yeah and then you'd be like ah oh, well then they're gonna do this and they're gonna do that and then you know you start thinking about how much could go wrong and then sometimes they show you how much could go wrong and you know you you might have taken time to build up a relationship like I value the relationships I have with, you know, with some of the sports teams I have here. And sometimes there are projects that they'll ask me people to bring in on and I know exactly what they need. And I'll be like, but these people can't do that. They're not up to that. Right. And if I bring them in and they, they mess it up, it's not their name that's going to be messed up. So chain. Right. Right. They'd be like, yo, blues, what is this mess? We're not going to, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, ugh. So it's it's that. It's it's that part of learning when to, you know, take people out of an equation that, you know, that you think that they might fit. And you hopefully can apply them to something different. Mm-hmm. But that's those are a couple of the things that I've learned to you know, put down so I can move up and and I moved up. I'm not gonna front. I moved up a lot. And a lot of it has just been saying that I'm good enough to do this thing. I'm gonna do this thing. I'll take the weight right now and then when I can move other situations in later then I will. So it's 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 been it. I've been on a on that kind of grind. Wow. And I'm going to summarize what he says if I still remember and and not still digesting them. Um, one you said time, mm-hmm. which you you are sometimes good at it. You work on it. I try it's a work in progress, <laughs> <laughs> and not getting into your way. Not a procrastinator, but you try not to overthink and get into your own way. Right, and you have to learn to let someone go if you feel they are not really fitting the equation. Right. Oh, that's not their strength. You have to let them go so that you can keep moving. And one more. I think I missed one. No, that was it. That was it? Yeah, that was just the three. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, discipline. No. Yeah, oh, yeah discipline. No yeah, way yeah. I would have forgotten that yeah, yeah, because discipline. I was thinking about like, shoot, got to be yeah. discipline. <laughs> and I was tying discipline in with getting in my own way. So, yeah. yeah. That is excellent. 
So at this point, Blues, we are curious. I'm saying we because we are curious. What do you have coming up? Do you have anything this month or anything, any project that is going to be online, which anybody who is listening to this show, this episode on Instagram, not on Instagram, on, in, on Instagram, yeah. YouTube, or uh, any podcast platform could check out if they are listening to it in 2019? Um, few things, quite a few things. Um, I just started a brand ambassadorship with Power in Black. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a t-shirt I have on now. So they're nope. a really cool t-shirt company. Just delivering black excellence all over the place with really cool quotes and really cool, you know, really cool looks on their t-shirts. Um, a book that's getting ready to come out um, called And Then Tamir. It's uh, open letters written to Tamir Rice, who mm-hmm. was uh, gunned down by by uh, police in Ohio. Um, he was just a kid. He had a toy gun and... oh police rolled up i don't even think it was like three seconds and they shot him killed him so that book's getting ready to come out i'm actually um going to be talking with his mother uh tomorrow i don't know when this will come out but by the time you see this i will have spoken with his mother about what this book is going to be about and part of the part of the um proceeds are going to go to the tamir rice foundation Mm -hmm. so just working with her and keeping her son's name alive and and still fighting these injustices and, and reminding people that we're still dying. And that's what it's about. Like, and it starts off with, and then Tamir, they shoot down another brother, they shoot down another. And it's a, the book just keeps going like that. And it's, it's a book that I've been working on for probably two years because every time I want to be finished, something else happens, something else happens. Right. And then that creative thing that we talk about just, rises up mm-hmm. and I got to put it down on paper. So well, working with that, I have a, an album that is supposed to be coming out very soon um, called Obscure Popularity, which it has a book companion with that. So mm-hmm. hopefully dropping that by the end of December, hopefully going into the new year and just man, working on different projects with different people. Um, shouts out to De Niro Farrar, jumped on his project before and, I've worked with a uh, thousand times music was here. Mm-hmm. He, he, I was worked with him before on some of his stuff and he actually sent me some music. I got you covered, brother. It's coming. Um, <laughs> and just, you know, working with different artists in the city, man, it's, it's been really cool. Um, I'll be in Atlanta on the six for passion and poetry, celebrating Miss Joyce Lattell and her 35 years in radio. Uh, a lot. If you just go to my Instagram, it all pops up and it all pops up. And, uh, yeah, we out here grinding, man. Of course, the slam, slamcharlotte.com. We do that every third Friday. The next one will be October 19th, I think, mm-hmm. or 18th or something like that. So come on out to that. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm moving and I'm shaking. Just keep up. I like the word movers and shakers. <laughs> <laughs> so um, creative, entertaining people, if you're listening, <sighs> This is blues. I know. Right. And I remember one of the guests said, slam poetry, they are yet to scratch the surface. They are yet to figure out where things are going with that. They are scratching to see how bigger it could get. Mm -hmm. So I would say, quote unquote, it's a tough industry. Yeah. Yeah. And if he has been able to keep at it for this long right and being able to sustain a family with what he's doing then believe in what you're doing that whatever you're doing out there you can also find your way to do what you want to do and at this point he's going to share something little about any any three helpful tips about your life being because you've been out you've been in here for a while you know yeah yeah when you came to shout i was two years old (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah. So um, any three helpful tips tips you could give to someone out there? I'd say one, trust yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, trust your art, trust your process, trust your ideas, trust yourself. Because the minute you start showing doubt is the minute you will completely doubt everything. And you won't believe in anything you're doing. And then what's the point? Then what's the point? 
Um, the second thing I think I would say is don't <laughs> say yes. Say yes to a lot of things. Say yes to things that you don't think are exactly in your wheelhouse. Um, I said yes to NASCAR. I said yes to working with some ballet dancers. I said yes to doing something with a circus. I say yes to a lot of things that just don't necessarily fit what I'm doing, but they all manage. Well, some of them work very well. Some of them were like, eh. some of them were like, yeah, it didn't work at all, but it was cool to try because now you've created a network mm -hmm. and you've created a relationship with people that you would have probably never met. And I think the third thing I would say is, and this will go back to when I say there's some people that you can't take with you. There are some people that are going to be really great friends. They're going to be the best friends you ever had. Mm -hmm. But they're also going to be the people that you cannot take into a business meeting. That you <laughs> cannot take with you into what your vision needs to be. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. Because they, they believe in you, but they not, may not believe in what you do. And they may not always say it. Um, oh, yeah. You can feel it from time to you time. You can feel it from time to time. And don't take it personal. That's why I say, that's why I tell people, don't take that per part personal because that will drag you down. Because you'll be worried about, well, why ain't they feeling me? They're supposed to be my friend. Da, 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 da. Maybe they just don't like it. And yeah. that's fine. Because there might be 40,000 people who do. You know? I don't necessarily enjoy Beyonce. Mm -hmm. But on the run tour... I might go because Jay Z's there, you know. <laughs> is and that Beyonce, a, true, a true fact? That is a true fact. Um, <laughs> but that ain't that ain't affecting what Beyonce do. She mm -hmm. gonna do because she knows there's people that just don't like what she does. But there's a million more that do. So, again, keep your friends as 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 friends if they if you know that they're not gonna be any good to you towards your vision. Don't let them drag your vision down. Don't let anybody drag your vision down. Stick to it. If there are people who are there to con help you creatively construct and constructively give you criticism, mm -hmm. those are cool people. But people who are just hating your shit and they have no reason other than just to hate it or bring you down, yeah, y'all can have beers all day, watch a game, whatever. But when it's time to go to work, when it's time to do business, Out. when it's time to create, yeah, push them to the side. Y'all catch up later. Um those are my three things, man. Wow. Just, just, and love yourself. Wake up every morning and remind yourself that you are important, that you're worth everything that you're fighting for, and go out there and just crush the day. Entitlement with work. <laughs> wow. Exactly. Entitlement with work. That is amazing. Those are amazing points. Huh, I can use some. <laughs> <laughs> Man. So uh, now you are in Slam Poetry Nationals. You won. You, the team won it. Mm -hmm. So in that industry, that's in that whole performing art. What three helpful tips would you give anybody in that area? Oh, so that, and <laughs> that's crazy because with Slam, with mm -hmm. winning this, people would expect. There was like some sort of big thing to pop off. You get TV deals, da 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 da. Nah, nah. It's however you left uh -huh. is how you come back. It's just this now you've got a title. A title. So it, it nothing really changes in that aspect. But I but there's still some things some things that you can do. Um, as a slam poet, I would say work on being a poet. Mm -hmm. And don't worry about, you know, winning a slam or whatever. That'll come. That winning comes. But you can't do slam forever. Like a boxer can't box forever. A football player can't play football forever. Eventually, you'll have to transcend up out of there and do something different. Figure out what that is. Figure out how to elevate your craft. Elevate the poems that you do. Um, turn them into something different. If there's a poem that can be a one-man show. Yeah, turn your one man, turn your slam poem into a one man show. Boom, you can do that. Um, the second thing I would say is really kind of start getting 
business minded because with slam poetry especially in this stage of video and stuff you can kind of create a reel that you could submit to colleges and get booked doing college shows mm -hmm. but you just have to have content i want to say that again so the people can hear me don't just think that you can do two poems at a college and that be it. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> you got to have at least, I and I, and this sounds crazy, have at least a 90 minute show of poetry that works. And it's not just getting up there doing a poem, a poem, a poem. It's actually getting up there doing a poem, having something to say in the middle, some content, some transition, all of that. It has to all work like that. There's been so many poets who just get up there and think, I'm going to do three poems and I'm going to start call it tour, call, um, touring colleges. No, you're ruining the game by by doing trash work and then bringing that trash work. And then these colleges will be like, well, I think they're going to think that every slam poet does that now. And you're just ruining it for people out there. So get your catalog together. That's what I'm saying right to your face right now. Yeah. Get your catalog together. Yeah, it's almost a raise your standards. Yeah, raise your standards. And um, I guess the third thing I would say is get into uh, creating visuals for your work or a book or record some music. Like just try some new stuff with, with your work. Like step out of the open mic zone, step out of the slam poet zone and see where else your work can work, you know expand your expand your imagination and, and your creative creative aspects creative goals yeah just like you can potatoes is not just known for fry uh french fries right they could you can make uh what is it called mashed potatoes out mashed of it potatoes you can make so many things you can make some gun out of it i saw something on youtube <laughs> 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 some crazy stuff uh, so Expand your horizon, try to create, be create more creative and create something out of thin air, but from your creative, the creative thing you do. Right. And also you said, oh boy, my brain is losing it. You, you The first one was, you um, can't bring. Oh, what was the first thing I said? You, uh, now my brain is gone. I know we definitely said you got to definitely bring more to the table, table in terms of your college stuff. 90 minutes show. Right. And uh, be prepared to kind of expand outside of what you're doing in slam poetry. Don't mm -hmm. think that That's you can do it. this forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got, you got to be able to move on. There's only like three people who can actually still do slam no, that's not, that's not true. There's a lot of people who still can do it. They just don't. They're doing other things, but they could easily slip back into slam and still crush it. Um, and they've proven that time and time again. But they've also proven that you should be able to expand past just doing a slam and being good at that. So, yeah. Wow. That is excellent. Since we are still talking about slam, in a moment we'll be wrapping up, but stay tuned. Since we are still talking about slam, tell me, what do you think about the industry <sighs> that is a very good question p um the community operates on a couple different levels mm. so the national poetry slam is a community all in itself where you have poets from all over the country who are competing for one prize and working inside that community and that community for me, and I'm speaking just for me, and there's a, a there's a few more black men who can who can attest to what I'm saying. Has become a place where it can be unsafe for mm. because they like to use this word safe space. It can be unsafe for a black male inside that community because um, where where I guess the marginalized and victimized people have sort of become the power and become the bullies and use their influence to make things happen the way they want to happen. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not anything crazy, but unless you, unless you've been on the side where, you know, you felt the pushback, you wouldn't know it. So it's, 
I've grown a little bit. It's a little bit bittersweet when we talk about the National Poetry Slam community. Mm -hmm. I love them, but at the same time, I keep my distance. I do what I need to do. I talk to the people who I need to talk to. But aside from that, I think there's people that you just can't trust. Mm -hmm. And I think there's people who have been hurt so much or been a victim so much that they sometimes flip that on people and don't know, may not know that they do that, which is why I've learned to just keep my distance from all that. But um, the poetry, and then we've, if we start talking about poetry as a whole, that industry is really funky right now because, you know, with, with, with YouTube being a really accessible tool, some poets are really just grabbing on and doing that one or two poems and that one or two poems goes viral and now they're huge successes, mm -hmm. but they're only a huge success from those one or two poems. And then you find out that the rest of their catalog sucks, <laughs> right? And so you're wondering, you who has probably accomplished a lot, you're this poet and that, that you've done this and this and this, aren't getting that same recognition. And you, you get frustrated. You get super frustrated. But that's when you go back and say, listen, I'm just going to keep focused and doing what I'm doing mm -hmm. and staying in my own lane. But I, I think there it hasn't been any like super breakout superstar poets there might be like maybe two or three when we talk about like a rudy francisco or a, or a mo brown or something like that or jasmine mans people who have really kind of excelled above just you know being i say in the normal poetry stratosphere they've gone higher than that but they're still very normal people doing very normal things um they've just gotten access to a lot of really big opportunities and they've rocked those opportunities they've mm -hmm. rocked them well um, and really leveled up for other poets to come up. And I think their successes need to be studied and respected if you're going to try to get to where they're going because they're paving a way for people. But I think people are just trying anything and doing anything, hoping to just get that instant success, and it doesn't work like that. No and if they, yeah, if they watch how these people grind and watch how they work, you could, you too could do that same thing with your own craft and, and do that. But... You know, I think poets are still in some of them, some are in this get rich quick kind of thing, very hip hop kind of thing, mm -hmm. where they'd be like, I'm just going to get one good poem and ride that wave. And with hip hop, you could do that because it's music and you get your thing played everywhere. Poetry don't work like that. Like, you know, yeah. Uh, is he talking? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they just move right past it. So it's, it, it's, it's a really funky field that, that, that ebbs and flows. There are some people who are super successful, people who are reaching for that success, and there are people who are just operating in their own little world. So. Wow. Creative people, creative entertaining people, admirers, if you're listening, this is Blues, and we are about to end it. I know I said that earlier, but listen, we are about to end it. At this point, he's going to tell us where we can find him. And after that, he'll give us, we'll gossip. We'll just gossip. Any random thing, any random thing. You can whine, you can um, curse, you can compliment, you can criticize anything you want. But before th that, where can they find you? You can find me uh, on Instagram, blues, 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 B-L-U-Z, B-L-U-Z, B-L-U-Z. Also on Twitter, Mr. Blues, M-R-B-L-U-Z. And my uh, Facebook page uh, should be Boris Blues Rogers. I don't get to get to it too much, but it's there. Um, and then, of course, check out Slam Charlotte. Uh, that's Slam Charlotte everything for Twitter and Instagram. And be on the lookout for that book. And just, man, spread the news. You know, tell everybody to follow your boy because that's what you do for the Instagram. I don't know if you follow me I, I follow back and I really appreciate that and just if you see me post something super dope super creative repost it help me share stuff I, I'm nine times out of ten I'm sharing somebody else who's doing something super cool so you know try to do that just just boost up the city boost up this culture that's what we gonna do then that was blues he said boost up the city boost up the culture blues crazy people blues let, let, let's gossip this is a private conversation they right. could choose to listen <laughs> so tell me any public issue any private issue any 
public figure, any global thing you want to talk about, you want to compliment, you want to criticize, you want to vent at, you want to... <sighs> what um, is this? I'll, 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 I'll do a quick vent. Oh, let it flow. And it's for, it's for the city of Charlotte. Uh, and it's for black folks in Charlotte. Mm-hmm. Black people in Charlotte, stop saying that there ain't shit to do when there's so many creative things happening in this city. So many creative things. And stop stop saying, I'm not going to go if no one else goes. Stop being <laughs> a follower, man. No one else goes. Do what you want to do. If you want to go to a weird yoga goat climbing party, do it. Don't worry about what anybody else is thinking. Charlotte has been known for not being a trendsetter, but being a following city. And sometimes I see the mat- that mentality fall into place so many times. So... Shout out to all the creators out there, all the artists out there pushing and pushing and you 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 not getting that support that you don't think you should have. Trust me, it's coming. Just keep doing what you're doing. Don't be afraid to step outside the city. It's all right to get success in Atlanta. It's all right to get success in Houston. It's all right to get success in Chicago, L.A., New York and come back to Charlotte and this is where your home is. It's okay to live here, create here and it's and just take your take your funkiness, take your creativeness to any other city where they'll appreciate it. Trust me, you'll thank me for it and when you come back you'll be like I see what you was talking about. Because the city won't appreciate you until you blow up. And then when you blow up and then do stuff other way other places they'll be like, "Oh, he don't want to man. man, don't listen to him. Like just yeah. do what you want to do." <laughs> That's my vent. That's my vent. So, Charlotte, stop being followers. Be trendsetters. Support your own. Support the folks that you know live here. And that's what's up. You heard Queen City. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. So yeah. that, that's all you want to let out. I mean, and I I think that's it. I, I, I don't know if I have too much more. Hip-hop community, y'all need to come together because y'all got some dope hip-hop people here. And, and y'all need to support them. Y'all need to lift up cats like Elevator J and De Niro and... And a, a lot of these other hip hop cats out here. So hip hop community, y'all y'all get it together too. Uh, producers, y'all need to y'all y'all got some really dope sounds here. Support these events that are trying to lift you up. Um, we had this this uh, event called Sounds and Sixteens, and didn't get a whole lot of support. We we had strong support from those who really understood the movement mm-hmm. and, and understood the craft. So shouts out to them. Um, and then we had to shut down because the venue shut down. And so now there's that, that's gone. So I want y'all to realize when a space is gone, when a space is taken from you, Gradually. figure out what, where are you going to go next? If you don't support it, if you don't send people to support it, you'll, you'll be left with, with just trying to blow up from your, your, your room or your basement or wherever you rocking from. And that's, because will come listen to me. Right. <laughs> That'll be the only place. That, that shit be, sucks. And, uh, yeah, man. And, and politically or whatever, um, watch out for all this damn gentrification. Watch yeah. out for it, y'all. They sneaking in. Gradually. And, and they're, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna make it all real different if you don't lock it down. If you got property, Hold on to it. If your grandmama got property, find out how to hold on to it. There are resources out here that will help these older generation of people keep their homes because they are offering these these older generation, these older folks, cash money for their houses. And, the, and they're not giving them what they're worth, not what they're going to make on their houses. So keep it tight, man, and, and, and y'all stay connected and support each other when y'all can. And, and that's me. That's usually what my my vents and my rants are about. Yeah. It's just support, support, support. Support. Yeah. You know, um, looking driving by the city, going to uptown, Noda is gradually becoming somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And I wish I knew the whole plan they have, so that the people will buy into it. Right. It's like all you see is building here, building there, building. So, what is the main goal of this? I, the their main goal was, especially for Noda, it all starts with that with that light rail. Mm-hmm. When they put that light rail in, you'll notice that everything around that light rail starts growing and it starts expanding from that part. But it really started um, with Johnston Mills. So the Johnston Mills sits right across from what used to be the wine up, and I, I'm not sure if 
if your people will know about that, but it's 36 in Davidson, that, that mm. whole area. And it was an, it was an old, it wasn't old at the time. It was a mill and, you know, a lot of creative people live there. Um, JC used to live there. Q used to live there. A lot of the poets that you know and singers and artists you know live in that building. And then one day when they come home, there's like police there and all kind of stuff telling them they can't stay here anymore. They have to evacuate the building because of termites. Mm. And the building was going to fall. They made it sound like this building would fall at any moment. To this day... That same building, that same structure is still standing. And now it is, I think the rent there used to be maybe 200. It's probably 16 to $2,000 to live there now. So what they do is they play a long game. Now that happened in like 1999 and they sat on that property for at least 10, 10 years. And... The genius behind it is genius. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they just wow. sit and let people get angry, and they dis and they displace people. They figure if we can spread them out far enough, and get them nice and settled in something else, then we'll just time, gradually time come back will in. heal your wounds. Yeah, and that's what they do, y'all. That's what they do. They get you comfortable with something else, so that they can move in, change elevate or elevate and increase the the property tax around it because it, it'd be different if they were moving businesses into these neighborhoods to elevate the the property value for the people who live there without it skyrocketing you don't see them building a business you see them building buildings for people to live in the cost is not going to be something which quote unquote the creative people are how is it the city that feeds us is not feeding us enough but right. where we are supposed to lay our heads tends to be too costly then guess what we wouldn't be able to be there exactly the city is not really or the people are not really supporting which i'll say i'm part of the people in charlotte everybody in here if we are not doing our best to 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 support the creative scene they wouldn't get enough money to also live around these closed places, like right. this, this, I'll say, upscale places. Exactly. Or maybe they too also need to up their games and raise their standards, you know. Who but knows? the city yeah. has its way of... <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. The city has its way of, of just duping people, man. And I, and I don't get me wrong. I love the city. Like, I am super proud of where I live. Um, I, I got to go to Denver with, you know, city delegates, people who work for the government center, policemen to go to Denver so we could bring home the uh the USA the the All America City Award which mm -hmm. you know they award just certain cities for being an All America city and I got to work with them on that and they uh, and they understand the problem so half of what's happening are is done by people who don't live here mm. they don't even live here these developers don't live here. They don't operate here. They don't know the culture. They don't know the people. They just see property and see money. And then they don't care if a venue that's been there for 30, 40 years that's brought in bands and poets and artists of all kinds. You just know, we'll knock it down, build yeah. a condo. See dollar signs. That's it. And 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 I don't know if the city tries to stop it because they also see dollar signs. They are allowing it to happen, right? Yeah, a, a lot of a lot of the times they're just like, oh, okay, yeah, well, we'll make a buck from that. We'll make a buck from that. We'll make a buck from that. And you're just like, yo, <laughs> this <laughs> Family Guy once said. Francine Smith on Family Guy, a cartoon, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> said that Charlotte was devoid of culture. Really? It's <laughs> And it's, you know, because they make those quick jokes about a thing. And when when they said that, I was like, I don't know who wrote that, but they were accurate as fuck when they said it. When they said it at that time, I was like, God, 
who gives who gave them that information because that is a very specific thing to say i mean you could say new york has a lot of murders or chicago it's a lot of it's just a very general kind of you know everybody says kind of thing but to say that charlotte was devoid of culture i was like that that is too accurate and yeah, too right it's, on it's the an nose. inside that job <laughs> yeah and i'm trying to figure out who from that show <laughs> could say that about charlotte i'm like god that is so crazy but Yeah man that that when I heard that that it was funny and hurtful at the same time because wow. I was like are we is that how people see us because you and I know mm -hmm. that's not true yeah you and I know that there's plenty of artists here in the city who are trying to raise the level of what we do and trying to raise the 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 awareness and trying to make people see where we are and what we're doing but then we get we get washed over by all the money and the politics and people who are just want to build on top of everything man so yeah it's i guess in due time um something is going to happen you know something is going to happen mm. yeah i'm ready for that's it that's how i feel and the robot will meet the road the robot will meet the road soon yes yeah so let's see So, creative people, this is blues. This is creativity is an idea. And today our guest was blues, blues, blues. Yeah. Who is, hey, give them your title. I am the slam master of Slam Charlotte. Uh, poet, just dude in the city. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I'm very, uh, I appreciate you being here. Thank I really you, man, for having me. I appreciate it. I really, appreciate really it. appreciate it. So, creative people, if you're still listening, I want to thank you for listening. I would encourage you to rate us, share, keep listening, and give us some reviews and feedback, and subscribe. Because, you know, we, when you subscribe, you will get quality guests like Blues on the show for you to keep listening, for you to get some value out of this creativity. is an idea podcast. So, and as always, I am your host, Pyrick, and please don't fuck up. When you do fuck up, make sure you fuck up real good to help others on a bigger level. So, this was a pleasure. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Was it was a pleasure. Thank you. That was quite a... This was probably the longest one we've done. <laughs> yeah, one hour, 19 minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs>